being in a metal band. Yeah, it's like uh, sometimes you've got to put on an act, I feel, you know, like it's, it's, it's yeah, because I'm just this laid back dude, who, you know, doesn't, you know, I don't look metal, I don't dress metal, but once you get up there, you know, you just got to deliver and just got to try and be the brutalest gun anyone's ever seen, you know, that's what I try and do. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's like a way of life now. Who I am, I suppose. <laughs> um, it's always, it's always been a relaxed feeling because there's no, um, there's no expectation of uh, writing a, a number one radio hit. You know, you've just uh, relaxed. You've got um, a bunch of different dudes with different influences coming in. Um, everyone's got different ideas floating about, and the whole idea of writing songs that everybody agrees with and everybody's into is uh, quite a good feeling, and it makes a real family unit out of, out of any band. It's um, a way of uh, expressing what sort of goes on in my head, you know, you know, like walking down the road and stuff, I'm just thinking of metal riffs and, and that kind of thing. And like, yeah, having, having the band, it's just a, a way of expressing that and having a fucking good time as we do it. <laughs> it has changed my life and, and as far as, you know, being being in a metal band is concerned, it's really a dream come true uh, for me. The, the fun I've had over the years on the road with the boys and, and the people that you meet on, on your travels is, is just priceless really and, and you know to think about not ever playing a guitar in my life and then pretty much within the space of six months to a year being, being in my own band was, was awesome and yeah, the, mainly the, the people you meet and, and the fun times you have on the road is, is what it's all about, to be honest. Deep Express, all aboard! I guess it all started at um, first year of high school, boys high. I actually uh, met Matt in my class, he was a uh, class captain. Sort of a goody good, you know, sort of a brainiac that thought, man, this guy's pretty onto it, you know, sort of just quiet, does his work, but stays out of trouble. I thought, oh, yeah. Seen him around the way, you know, lunchtime and interval, and thought I'd be a bit of a smart gun and show off to me mates. And, uh, yeah, seen him eating his sandwiches one day outside, I was just by himself, and just couldn't help myself. Walked up to him and, uh, knocked his lunchbox out of his hand and the sandwiches went flying all over the ground and this, of course this pisses him off and he starts chasing me around the whole school for the rest of lunchtime and they here come here little fucking go, I'm gonna fucking smash you. Next thing you know it's uh, time for class and we're lining up and I hear this guitar and it was, I think it was Nirvana, aneurysm I recall the song, I was really into Nirvana then, I thought man he's bang on playing that, who is that? So I sort of just pulled myself out of the line, you know, and rock into the music room, and it was Matt, you know, this guy that I've been getting cheeky to and smart, and he chased me around trying to smash me all day, and I said, oh, shit, man, fuck. I said straight away, I pointed at him and said, I'm coming around to your house after school. <laughs> and he just looked at me playing a day, and went, oh. just carries on, just playing his Nirvana, and I was, Back in then, after that, man, it was just on, you know, it was like friends from there. I think I was about eight years old or something, and my mum uh, took me to guitar lessons. Um, and I think the first song I ever learned was uh, Stand By Me, the old four chord wonder. Um, and so, straight after my first lesson, I learned that song, and I said to him, oh, give me a guitar, give me a guitar. So we went to the music shop. Had a look at a guitar and uh, I tried playing all the same four chords that I just learned, but uh, I must have just, you know, just not actually learned them and it just sounded like crap. And I was like, oh man, what am I doing wrong? But um, now nah, my mum ended up getting me a guitar for Christmas and then that was it. I was just into it and never, never stopped. <laughs> Matt had this idea he wanted to start a band. Um, and he came up with a band name pretty much straight away because he was just lying on his bed playing his guitar, saw the 
this little metal rose that he had sitting up on his, by his mirror there. And he was like, yeah, let's call it metal rose. And so I thought, yeah, it's a bit dumb, I don't want to call it that, you know. And he's like, no, but we can spell it like rose, you know. Like metal rose, rose of metal. <laughs> I'm just thinking, oh, you know, oh, like, all right, but wasn't too fond of it. And we just, so we just carried on making our songs and Matt was the main influence and I just pretty much learned off him. Well, I mean, I'd always just made up songs and stuff, but then like it, it got to the point where me and Ryan were like standing in my garage. Um, I was playing guitar and he was playing bass guitar and, and we were playing these songs and making making all these songs, but uh, we just couldn't find a drummer and couldn't actually get it together. <laughs> We heard about this radio station, um, the Rev, the Rev 107.3, and uh, 107, I've never been past like 100 on the FM dial, you know, so I sort of picked it up, it was, oh yeah, it was a little bit scratchy, the first thing I heard when I, when I tuned into that station and got it a bit clear, make out what was happening, it was, um, I remember Sepultura was Roots, it's the first song I heard, and, and turning on the radio and hearing, uh, you know, metal on the radio for everyone to hear was like, it was my dream from, from you know, when, you know, when I was into Pantera, you know, Corn, Slipknot, you know, and uh, Nirvana before that, and I always thought, man, why don't they play this stuff on the radio? And, and here they were, this local Palmy radio station, busting metal out the wang over the airwaves, and fuck. I ended up getting a, a computer that had GarageBand and then uh, that was it, we were off, I found out how to do MIDI drums so didn't need a drummer. And <laughs> me and Ryan ended up recording, I think we, we, we got down to about 10 or 11 tracks or something like that and put it on a CD and then we were randomly driving through, uh, through town in Palmy and uh, like we'd known about this, there was this metal, metal station that you know Ryan come across by accident that just plays brutal metal all the time. It's like everything was good, um, and then we we hear this guy start talking. He's like, "Oh, you know, this is the Rev FM, and uh, if you've got any requests or, or anything, you know, here's a, here's a number." And we were, we were thinking, "Fuck, well, let's 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 hit them up. See if they'll play our CDs. See if they'll play our music, man. We'll crack it. We'll make the big time." <laughs> we heard the number. On, on, you know, when we were listening to the Rev, and uh, <laughs> so Matt's like, yeah, let's run them up. And he, uh, he dials the number, and I remember sitting next to him, and he was like, yeah, is this the Rev? Oh, hey, how do we, like, get, like, our CD, um, like, played on the radio? And at this time, he was talking to who we didn't know at the time, but it turned out to be Jamie. This dude answers the phone and like, this is the Rev, and we're like, oh, um, I've got this CD, I was just wondering if you guys might play it, you know, not knowing how an actual radio station works. And this guy on the other end of the phone is like, yeah, bro, yeah, sweet, it's here, fall on down. So we end up coming down and then, uh, end up, like, went up there and gave him the CD and he chucked it on straight away right in front of us, which we were like, whoa, holy shit, man. And then he pulled out a bong and shouted us a bong. <laughs> for, for me, for a start, coming from you know a background of listening to rap and, and all the gangster music that the East Coast threw at me back in the days, coming here and, and getting metal thrown in my face was a big thing to get used to. I, I did listen to Pantera and shit in the early days, which was a, a massive influence on me today and will always be. But yeah, it was sort of a lot to, to get used to. Um, and as far as live bands is concerned, I never witnessed anything until that, that day that a certain Mr. Freeman <laughs> dragged me along to a foot sativa show and it just broke my ass. It was pretty much the, when I first moved to Palmy, the, the Rev was where it all sort of started, being in the garage there and having access to, to the metal bands that were around Palmy and going along to the shows and again you know you're always meeting meeting new people and, and it was at that time I picked up a guitar as well and, and started to sort of, you know, take take the hobby a bit more seriously and, and learn a, a, a bit more 
about you know what I was, I was going to be doing and, and I really enjoyed that and from there I'm um, doing the show at the Rev and, and getting getting metal out there and Palmy pretty much met everyone on the scene you know over shit the space of a few months you know we would have gone to 10 shows or more and, and the amount of people you meet in that short space of time is, is just amazing and, and the amount of musicians out there as well that are, are keen to, to get together and, and play metal is, is just phenomenal so it came from there um, the boys Matt, Matt and Ryan were already pretty accomplished as far as being musicians are, are concerned and and they had had their own little project going with Metal Rose which you know to me was well these these guys are, are pretty cool man let's let's get their shit on the radio so that all that all happened and, and they were pretty blown away by the fact like they said earlier you know we want to we want to get played on the radio and, and half an hour later their, their shit's getting played on the radio you know so that was that was how how those two come along and, and things just went from there I, I met a, a few other boys um, in Malhop, Tony, Kia, and uh, Aaron Sheriffs, and the Fallen Hero boys who, who, in a drunken haze one night at a party at Burke Street, I was playing some of my Mouldy Waitas on the acoustic guitar, and, and young Malhop said, You should join our band! You should join our band! I said, Mate, I've never played an electric guitar in my life. I, I don't know where to start, mate. I'm quite humbled that you would ask, but we'll, we'll discuss this in the morning and, and see where we go from there. And, he remembered it completely and I said, oh Malhop, you asked me to join your band last night. And I thought, you know, he must have been drunk and full of shit. But from <laughs> from from there I, I joined their band, Fallen Hero, which was, you know, the, the kickstart of, of me playing in, in a metal band. And, and it all just sort of went from there. I'm grateful for those boys for giving me that chance. And, and from there got a got a bit better, with, tighter with Matt and, Matt and Ryan. And, and the cage was, was pretty much born... At the, at the same time the hero was doing the circuits, so it was going from being nothing to being in one metal band to being in two. <laughs> but the forming of the band was basically, uh, well, I mean, the, the, last, the last band we were in, Metal Rose, they sort of came to an end, and then we were just sort of sick of not jamming. Um, the house I was living at, there was a drum kit there at the time. And Jamie uh, could barely play guitar at, at that stage, and he's. But somehow we uh, managed to make a band out of that. Cage Demise started, and, and we started jamming along, and, and like Ryan mentioned, a, a few covers was just to get our get our, our feet in the mud, so to speak. We just played songs, I think, uh, a bit of Hatebreed, Pantera, System of a Down, uh, Machine Head. Uh, I think the first one was. Um, Doomsday Jesus, eh, by, by Zach Wilde. Now, that, that was the, you know, the first song we got tight and down, and it was, you know, yeah. You know. Yeah, I think we, we basically just made one song uh, when we had one practice, and so that was it. We were like, oh man, let's, you know, let's play that one song over and over again. We didn't really muck around, to be honest, and, and got straight into it um, with, with the earlier songs. I think the, the first one really would have been Black Shirt, which... Was, I don't know if the boys would even remember that sort of shit back in the day, but it was just a, a song that I put together, uh, probably only had about 10 riffs in the entire song, um, just about wearing black black metal shirts everywhere you went. Yeah, Riffs of Fate, that was the first, the very first one that we, uh, that we all sort of had input in, all three of us, you know. Had the, Jamie had a couple of riffs in there, but then when Matt got onto that drum kit, you know, he, I saw him as the, you know, the general, the commander, he would point us in the right direction and he had all these ideas where he wanted the song to go and I always agreed with everything Matt said because it was always just the best idea for the song. It really was. And it was good because the boys, uh, all three of us being, being guitar players, um, made writing for me, because I'd never written songs myself before, it made writing for me real easy. Uh, it made things real hard at times because Matt was a very good guitar player in, in comparison to the skills I had at the time, so he'd be constantly throwing things at me, you know, Jamie, do it like this, do it like this, and I'd just be literally ripping my fucking hair out, going, Matt, I just can't do it, I just can't do it. So, you know, that, that he pushed me to the point where I would really lose the plot. But um, at, the, at the end of the day, it, it's made me what I am today. And yeah, I thank Matt for doing that and, and being hard on me in those earlier years because it, it has yeah, progressed me as a, as a guitarist.
First show, uh, first live show as a um, three-piece band. Napier, man. We uh, we it was New Year's Eve, <laughs> which was probably not the best of days to be doing a, a, a first show as a nervous uh, new band. Looking back, that must have been fucking terrible, but it felt cool. <laughs> We, we were sort of undecided about whether or not it was we were going to play any covers at that show because we obviously hadn't done anything like that before. We didn't have any idea what people were going to think of us uh, at, at that time. And, and there was some, I believe, Gant was around for a year at that time. So they'd been on the scene for a long time and, and had some respect out there. Can't recall, was Vatican on the bill? I believe Vatican, the Wanganui band, who have been around a number of years, very, very talented guys. Uh, we're on the bill, and, and it was quite in intimidating for us three who, you know, didn't know what people were going to think about music. And I think really to this day there hasn't been a lot of, of feedback about the show, and, and looking back it's quite hilarious um, watching us uh, as to, you know, I had to front the band somehow, and fucking hell, I, I, can't, <laughs> I, can't, I can't sing to save myself, and, you know, doing backup vocals over the years has been good, and I, I don't mind getting away with that, and using Ryan's bloody epic lungs to prop me up is, is kind of the way I'd rather do it, but I just crack up looking back now at, at that show. big ass fella from behind the bar go, oh you can smoke it here bro, and we're thinking, okay, I'm pretty sure that's illegal, but line one up anyway, and then he's like, oh if you got any weed, you can smoke that too, and we're thinking, fuck, that's not, <laughs> but sweet ass, so ended up having, having the best time we ever had at a pub. So all these patch members started walking in, and you know, personally I was thinking, fuck, I'm I think I want to get out of here now, you know, fucking the things might turn a bit fucking bit dodgy, you know, it's like we all fucked off down the beach. This is a song about a shit! Uh, Bunty, well, I just remember looking out the window, it was lambing season, and uh, there was this uh, little thing in the distance, all sort of looked like a dead sheep to me, a dead lamb. And uh, there was no other sheep around. It was just, just what looked to be a, a, a dead lamb carcass next to a little marum grass. And uh, so I sort of thought, oh, yeah, I'll put my shoes on and go have a look. So I fucking jumped the gate and uh, went out into the uh, the paddock there. And as I got closer, I was like, oh, it's a, shit, it's a brand new bloody newborn lamb, but he wasn't moving. I was like, oh, I might be dead, and it was covered in goo, and had this disgusting umbilical cord fucking hanging out, and yeah, it looked pretty disgusting, really, and uh, and then I sort of approached it, and um, I can't remember if I had a stick, or if I just poked him, or I think I poked him, to see, <laughs> you know, it was like it's a thing alive, and then it sort of kicked, and ah, like, oh, fuck it hell, it's alive. Oh. Fuck, feeling the wrath, feeling the power of Bunty. <laughs> oh, fuck, yeah. Man, uh, you just, all you had to do was just, one, not let him do the sniffing hack to your leg. And if you didn't let him do that, it was back up, psycho PIs, and then boom, he fucking eyed you up and he'd just fucking nail you. <laughs> it just. <laughs> Just wanted to kill everyone. Um, it was real funny though. It kind of had a, a pecking order, like um, like if it was just me and Ryan hanging out at, at Ryan's, then Bunty would just want to kill me. Just fucking hated me. As soon as anyone else turned up, but, you know, it could be Jamie, it could be James. 
then all of a sudden he's my best mate and he'll, he'll stand next to me and then he'll just go run after these guys. They were, they were terrified, they were petrified as like, like James <laughs> in particular went diving through my drum kit, just brought it, like you know, my pride, pride position, smashed everything and then he was just trying to get away from Bunty who was chasing him like, it was just ridiculous. And Jamie, Jamie just couldn't deal with it, it was like, just too much for Jamie. <laughs> I want to load my shit up. Yeah, go. I'm holding him. No, nah, fucking get him over the gate, man. No, nah, I just... <laughs> get him in the fucking gate! <laughs> <laughs> to sum up Bunty, I'm glad Bunty's off the face of this earth. And when Bunty, when Bunty died, it was a very, very uh, humble humble moment in my life, to be honest. Because I had said to Ryan over the years, I'll kill that fucking sheep myself. And <laughs> I was a qualified butcher and a freezing worker at the time, so it would have been no skin off my back. But yeah, good on you, Bunty, for inspiring us the way you did. But you're glad to see the back here, mate. <laughs> Get rid of the fucking chief! <laughs> Cage Demise had, had probably done about 10 or so gigs by that stage because uh, we were big time, you know. Uh, and then my my dad was actually um, doing some work in Pauperan for Project Hope, which is like a, uh, a youth suicide prevention support group charity type thing. Uh, yeah, so we ended up getting this, this pub, the Jolly Miller, which is the uh, same place I went to for my 8th birthday. Um, and he ended up sorting out a metal gig there, and that was, that was uh, one of those funny things as well, because it was uh, not, not a pub that you'd imagine a metal gig to be at, but here we were anyway. Um, and that was great, you know, free feed all night, free booze all night, shop dad. Um, and yeah, we had, had, a, had a real decent crowd. I mean, we played our set twice. We played played once and then had a big feed, some beers, <laughs> and then played again. Same songs, no one cared. <laughs> uh, I, remember, yeah. I remember those punters fucking shit up in that bar that night. Those, oh, yeah, those kids nice. got crazy in yeah. the pram. Hard out. Yeah, yeah that, was, that was cool. Pram. Big circle pits and crazy shit like that. The wiki P, well that, that was a case of, you know, just getting something down. I think at that time we had half a dozen, six or seven songs that were, were finished products and, and a few more that were work in progress. So we we knew, you know, but between us we had a, had the resources and, and the skill set to, to whip something out and we and we knew that the the quality of what was going around and, and as far as EPs were concerned it, well, it wasn't, you didn't have to spend big money to, to get it out there. We had had the rev behind us as well so we knew we'd get a bit of airplay out of it too um, which, which was fucking awesome at, at that time. Well I mean that was some funny shit. Uh, I got a mate um, and he, he just bought an electric electronic drum kit, a Roland kit. Uh, so we basically, we were, you know, we were just sort of started to play around with more advanced um, music workstations and that so we ended up recording all the drum tracks just off this rolling drum kit. No mention, no, no anything, just <laughs> straight line out from the module into the computer, boom, record. Um, which was easy because the drums were all compressed already. I just remember uh, Jamie doing his guitar stuff by himself, I think, on his own, and and then uh, he actually did bloody the bass tracks as well in the beginning, which I wasn't actually that happy about because, you know, I wanted to listen to the recording and think, yeah, you know, that's me in there, that I've, you know, I've had a part in that, but old Jamie, the, um, the king ratter, who's um, the king of ratting in, he was just like, oh, you know, like, no, I'll, I'll just do the bass tracks, eh? Hey? Yeah, fucking yeah, easy, I've got, I've got all the stuff here. And then, you know, he actually did the bass tracks, and I'm pretty sure that I went around to his house and uh, redid them myself. Just, you know, just, you know, I, I, you know, I was the bassist, I wanted to do it, you know? Um, yeah, it, uh, this two bedroom little unit at the time. Um, had to record some vocals in uh, this tiny little hallway that we'd 
little door, closed the door and you know, it was kind of like a um, like a cell really, like half a cell. Uh, yeah, they ended up, uh, ended up doing some mastering on it and, and tidying things up and trying to make it as brutal as possible but I mean, to be honest, the end product wasn't that bad. Um, it's just blindingly obvious that it was <laughs> an electronic drum deck. Um, but yeah, no, it actually, it actually sounded pretty good for, for how skilled we were at it. <laughs> and I, I think that we, we did a, a pretty good job with, with our songs there, seven, seven tracks, and including you know, a couple that weren't on the, the new album. Um, looking back, it, it's good to have those songs there to, to fall back on and, and the beginning of Lamus and Eight was, was one of the newer sort of tracks we'd written where, where things started to, to get a, a little bit different as far as the direction we were heading in um, was concerned. So the, the Wiki P, of course inspired by our main man Ruben Wiki, um, was, was a, a good stepping stone and uh, even looking back at it now, you know, I've certainly heard worse and and I'm sure I'll continue to hear worse demos in, in years to come and it probably only took us a week or two to, to get it all down so as, as far as that was concerned it was just good to get something out there and, and I'm sure our, our fans at that time, our small fan base would have, would have appreciated what, what they were hearing. gigs and um, we were just so, you know, listening to more more and more technical and, and awesome music we were like yeah we need to step up our game let's make some yeah you know, let's, let's put some more impact in our stuff so we just you know trying to write some more um, more technical and, and, and you know impressive stuff uh, and which I mean which in turn ended up with uh, well, the source of music, but Ryan, because he was playing bass, Ryan was only able to, to bust out the old blah, blah. <laughs> came a, a time where, obviously, Ryan, being who he is, uh, a, a fantastic talent with, with his vocals, and, you know, to this day, there's not many people around in this country who, who I would rate as a, a better frontman than him. Um, so it was about utilising what we had in the band and, and trying to make the most out of the, the talents we had. And there was times when I would run a little pedal box from my guitar into the bass rig because Ryan literally could not play and sing at the same time. And you know, the, the bass sits in the background, but when it's not there, you, you can certainly tell that it brings the whole band down. So I had this little pedal box and I'd push the button and, and my guitar tone would come through the bass rig to sort of beef things up a bit. Which we we got away with it, but it wasn't ideal. So the the change was to pretty much utilise what we had in Ryan and and to bring the best out of him, which was the best thing we ever did, really. Yeah, the idea to start to add a new member to Cage Demise that that all came about when um, you know we started becoming better musicians, especially Jamie and Matt were getting quite technical with the stuff they were writing. And um, being the bassist and vocalist, um, you know, these riffs were getting quite tricky. And to be able to sing and play these riffs at the same time for me was um, was actually damn near impossible. I remember them, they made their song uh, Predator. And that was the first song 
where I thought, I'm never going to be able to sing this and play these riffs at the same time because it was insane, you know? Yeah, I'm like, I, fuck, I physically tried and I couldn't do it. So we were like, right, we want to start getting more technical. We want to start making some more advanced metal. And um, it's, uh, I stepped up and um, just uh, had to drop the bass and just become solely vocals, which was... Something that um, felt quite uncomfortable at first, and um, bringing in a fourth member, playing the bass, and that uh, meant, you know, I sort of had to forget about that aspect of being in the band, holding an axe on stage, getting the stance, moshing around, and um, yeah, so that, that, that was why we we decided to go four piece just to make better better metal, more technical, more advanced riffs. As far as finding a bass player, we, we didn't really know where to start and, and we didn't really sort of have any idea as to who we were gonna get, but uh, Damo being you know a, a phenomenal bass player and having so much experience as far as being in bands, you know, he's been in more bands than we've had hot dinners over the years. Um, and and to, to have the opportunity to, to even ask a man of, of his calibre, uh, the, the ruler of the universe, stepping in, stepping into Cage Demise was, you know, it was a, another progression that, you know, certainly looking back was the best thing we ever did. Seven Dust and, and uh, anything that was sort of uh, mainstream hard rock at the time, I just sort of played around and um, ended up meeting uh, meeting a bunch of lads from New Plymouth that were in a band called Cynical Poi and they were looking for a bass player at the time because their, 
their um, former bass player, John Thun, um, decided he didn't want to play in the band anymore. And they um, held auditions. I turned up to the audition and they told me that I was their bass player before the audition was over and before they finished all the other auditions and said we found the guy and that's how I became part of the New Plymouth crew. That was 2001. So um, it's about me them lads. I, uh, about a half year later I joined a band called Cafe Latte who um, Every member of Cafe Lade is still around today. Nanos is um, in a band called Anno Domini Mortis, and I also jammed in a band later with him called The Gentleman's Club. And Joe, the drummer from Cafe Lade, um, came over to The Gentleman's Club as well. Um, Kimball was in a band with Nanos called Fist Fucked by Aliens. So he came over and he was our vocal, uh, vocalist for the Gentleman's Club. We played a very abstract style of jazz, heavy metal. Um, the reason Cafe Latte um, disbanded was because Bob, the vocalist, um, moved to Wellington and founded a band called Draco Arias. And uh, yeah, he seemed much happier down there. Um, after the Gentleman's Club, Nanos moved to Wellington as well. Um, the remaining members of the Gentleman's Club stuck together and recruited Sam Humphreys, who was uh, Fist Fuck by Aliens, and Rodney Volkey, who was um, Coles Ian, and formed a band called Insidious, which uh, Insidious maybe lasted about three years, I think, before Rodney moved away and Kimball had plans to move to Europe. So, um, it was during, um, during the Senegal Ploy tour that I met all the lads from the Reve FM and met all the Cage Smiles lads, played gigs, got on the piss, enjoyed life, and uh, really got a uh, pretty close, close connection with the Palmerston North scene. And, um, yeah, it's just been wicked. Everything's been wicked. A lot of happy memories. And um, yeah, so in 2008, I um, decided to change the scene was in order for my for my occupation and music. And I up and shifted to Palmerston North, where um, I got a a job. In the electrical field more on what I was interested in and um, proceeded to join a band called Project Blood who was at the time a uh, recording only band and uh, we just sort of, um, Rob Spleen and James Skeletor and myself just sort of sort of hung out in the bedroom and got pissed and wrote riffs and it was pretty much, um, I was a late addition to the band. I just merely um, mm -hmm. um, really gave interest in, in being the uh, basis for if they played live shows and uh, ended up being a, a writing member as well in that band. Now, um, how I came to jam with the lads, I put an uh, a email from Jamie one day saying, hey, um, you're going to be doing a cover set, are you going to be keen to play bass? And I was like, uh, could do. And I uh, turned up to the jam pad. I believe you were the driver. He came and picked me up, me and my bass, and we went and had this little discreet little jam. And, um, and uh, it all just sort of connected. Everything went well. We just sort of, everyone was chilled, everyone was same wavelength and uh, Ryan turns around and says to me, fuck bro, you should just be our bass player. <laughs> and and uh, I was sort of uh, taken back by that, coming from the current bass player. And um, 
everyone sort of jumped up and said, yeah man, that's a wicked idea, what do you reckon? <laughs> so yeah, I was sort of like, yeah, I'll give it a go. And uh, Jamie quite swiftly turned around and said, sweet, we've got a gig in two weeks, we want you to play. <laughs> so I was like, shit. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so two weeks later we're off to New Plymouth, playing as a four piece. Man, he changed the way our, our band, um, the direction we were going to go in, eh, you know, like, that, um, his input, the riffs that, you know, in between practices and that, that you just hear him just playing by himself on the bass and stuff, some of the riffs that he was coming up with was just unheard, sort of new territory for us, you know, and I remember putting his input to Sleep With The Worms, which I still think is the best part of that song, the breakdown where Damo comes in with his riff that he wrote on the bass and then Jamie comes over top with the guitar, then drums, and then I come in with a, a um, vocal and carry that Damo riff on for a couple of bars. And uh, I remember seeing Matt and Jamie both struggling with that one little riff that he put in there. And uh, it took us ages, it took us fucking ages. We didn't get it on that first practice. Because ages for Jamie, he had to sit down with Damo beside practicing and um, and like learn it properly because it, it, it was it was a new style. It was just so just something we never went not a road we never went down, you know. And I mean Damo came in, man. Even on stage performances and and everything, it just it just changed for the better for me. Like it was just more exciting. Just we just had. We just bonded straight away, man. Like, yeah, I love that fella, man. He, he's fucking awesome. He, he brought some awesome riffs to the table too. Um, just sort of, yeah, outside of the box that we were, we'd been in for a long time. It was just basically, yeah, all the all the many years and all the different kind of music that he's been into just sort of brought something else. And, yeah, just for that sort of show day that the. The shows we were putting on got a bit more intense, and you know, Ryan was free to jump around without a bass guitar, which was pretty cool. <laughs> Damo, um, Damo brought the best out of us as well. Probably for Damo, as far as what he'd listened to was concerned, and what his influences were in his background, it would have been something new for him. Uh, not, not his perfect style that he would probably want to be playing if he was writing the music, but his skills certainly made up for it, and, and having him in the band and. Having Ryan front the band was the best thing we we ever did, and I think the music that started coming from that was just a hundred percent step up on, on what we were doing. And you know, confidence-wise, you feel you feel a lot more confident when you're playing with with bigger bands, accomplished bands such as Sonate and and Eight Foot and, and Subtract, who we jammed with those bands as a three-piece. And you know, you, you feel so intimidated watching them as, as being you know, New Zealand's premieres in, in the heavy metal industry and, and you sort of think how are we going to compete with that and as a three piece we literally we got away with it but the sound was, was not as huge as, as it should have been the presence was good but not as good as it could have been and and from there you know we, we sort of felt a lot more confident playing with, with big bands and, and thought that you know we, we had stepped up to a, a new level um, which was, was really awesome so the, the best thing we did over the years was yeah change change to a four piece and and bring out Ryan's talents which was yeah as, as you can see the, the change from the wiki P to the the Alum, the Dead Elements album was was pretty much some well pretty much sum up where Cage and Mice had had changed over the years. <laughs> Please!
over the years, you know, we, we have, in all honesty, touched pretty much as many corners of the country as, as we have um, from far, sorry, from, from up, right up north. We, we never touched Auckland, which is a bit of a shame, but I, I'm sure something, something will come up in, in years to come and we'll get up those ways. But memory-wise, um, the most memorable show for me would, would have had to have been the, the bus. We hired the party bus from Palmerston North here, which was uh, PJ's party bus, and we, we packed it out with 50 people or whatever it, it held at capacity and paid the man his thousand odd dollars to drive us to New Plymouth with a busload of piss and a busload of metalheads. And that was, for me, the show was packed out as well. It helped having a busload of 50 people rolling in from Palmerston North and Wanganui to beef the crowd up. The, the show was packed out. Um, that, for me, at the basement bar was the most memorable show. under their wing, so to speak, when we were a new band, brand new band, you know, they always invited us to their shows and opened for them. We've been on the rest for a long time, as you know. Obviously, um, we've been on the rest for a long time, as you know. Obviously, Cam and Beth have been part of some of the boys as well, so I've known them guys really well. Um, yeah, they're all good dudes, so I've lived with them, jammed with them, fucking eaten with them. Uh, lived life, drunk piss. Everything else you do is part of a uh, underground band. For the love of, of metal music and rap is a, a prime example of you know working hard over the years. Yeah, it's taken them 15 years to get their album out. Damn, you know what's going on with that. But I'm, I'm sure when when the when the rap album comes out, it, it will be you know worth the the weight of half our lives to to see see that spectacle but you know they've been around for longer than just about any other metal band in this country and, and to have the honour of, of sharing the stage with them so many times over the years throughout you know Harney, Wellington uh, and, and you come at this as again yeah it's an honour to, to do that with, with such you know experienced and, and talented metal bands so yeah I, I take my hat off to the, the whole lot of them and, and, and thank all those guys for the, the shows that have put on for us over the years and, and the opportunities that they've given. Man, Sinead, um, what a privilege to, to be invited back so many times to, to open for them and and to even tour the South Island with them, you know? Uh, playing shows with Sinead was always, and I don't know, we've probably played 10 more or more shows with Sinead over the years. Um, and, and playing shows with them, along with 8 Foot Sativa being, you know, the members of, of those two bands are respected pretty much worldwide now as, as being, you know, quality, quality, worldwide recognised metal. The Sinead lads, I've known him for a while. On, uh, on Sam quite well since the um, eight, eight foot centipede days actually and uh, when I used to tour they used to come out come up to the um, rehearsal place that we had at the time called Diggity Bar they used to come up and get on the piss with us after the uh, after the shows at the, at the mill and um, yeah, when they uh, disbanded and Sam and Matt well Sam and Matt left eight foot and announced that they were reforming some eight. That was quite interesting. I and mean, that some eight was a um, was a band that they did in school in the early nineties. Quite um, quite exciting to hear about that. Yeah, Sinead Sinead is awesome. I mean the the first time ever that um we I saw them live was uh, way back in the day. Um, and that was yeah, 
we just sort of started the reef. I think there's a few pictures out there floating around where we're all young and you know, got the radical hair and all that kind of crap. But um, <laughs> no, nah, I mean, yeah, we, they was just like, oh, they're our idols, they're so amazing and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we ended up um, playing some gigs with them and obviously doing the tour with them down south and that was just cool as, you know, because it's like, there's, there's uh, party animals that managed to jump, put together worldwide tours and we were right there partying next to them and it was, you know, we felt real welcome and um, had a great time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Sinead, they're, they're always just real fun to be around. Yeah, prior, um, I mean, that's probably the, I, I think, uh, for, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if they've been around for longer than us or if, same, same amount of time as us, but I always remember the first time I saw them live, I was like, wow, man, this is, this is great, like, this is, you know, someone actually understands, like, the metal, <laughs> you know, it was just, just really, really cool and really shit, I mean, um, yeah, same thing, you know, you sort of become, become uh, pretty, pretty good friends with uh, the Pariah boys. Fuck, these cats are tough. I just remember seeing John Boy Pariah with bald head, the goat hair, and the brutalist stance in the world, just fucking. I was like, Jesus fucking hell. This is a good band. Um, Pariah, I've got, uh, got some old emulates quite well as well, since uh, playing the cage. Yeah, they're all in the same way. Had the same, uh, same ideas, you know, same, same lifestyle choice. Yeah. Pariah, you know, they were sort of the, the similar similar age to us boys and, and as far as the direction of their music and their influences were, were quite similar too. Um, so, you know, to have shows with them, Duncan Pavilion has always been very memorable. Uh, and John Boy, John Boy has been, John Boy and Cordis guitarist have actually influenced me quite a lot too, um, just with, with their style of, of, of play. And their yeah, prior would be closest to home, probably one of our, 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 our best friends as far as metal bands is concerned. And, and I'm sure for, for a long time coming, we'll be close with those boys and uh, hopefully get to grace the stage with them again would, would be a, a privilege. But yeah, prior and, and the shows they put on along the new was yeah, always another real good memory for, for the cage. The, uh, the thing that sticks in my mind about playing Napier was um, it was a uh, dress up party that <laughs> we played at. It was fucking cool. But we were like the only four dudes, five dudes, including myself, in the place that weren't dressed up. It was, it was clowns, it was fucking, fucking elephants, it was frogs. Fuck yeah, it was bizarre. <laughs> bizarre and hilarious. Oh, that sounds like that's good fun. Uh, Gunn, who we played our first ever show with, going back and, and playing shows with Gunn over, over the years, you know, has always been very memorable and, and very uh, humble to you know, know that those boys are still going and, and will still be going, I'm sure, for a number of years and, and hopefully we get to play shows with them again, which I'm, I'm sure we will. And I remember them coming on, they had this Huge, must have been something coming from the keyboard, a sample or something. Smoke bowling out of the smoke machines, pulled this purple light and shit, you could hardly see them. And I just remember seeing this this little fella and dressed up in all the army camo gears with the pack and fucking like, had his microphone and I was like, what's gonna happen here? This is pretty hard, but this big dreaded bassist and you know, these just these hard out looking motherfuckers really. And I was thinking, fuck. Yeah. And then as soon as they started, I heard their sound, I heard Rob's vocals and I, I I remember thinking to this day and still every time when I cut that mic and try and get a deep growl, I think of Rob from Gun from that moment when I, I looked at him and thought, that's what I want to sound like, that's what, I, that's heavy man, that is heavy. I remember thinking, that is a deep fucking growl what he's doing man. And, they were epic and I thought, man, this is a metal fan. This is it. The, these guys are fucking awesome, man. And from there, I think that inspired me to, to be a, um, a better vocalist, you know, to, to really hit those deep notes. 
and uh, uh, put that down to gunt, man, fully um, opening my eyes to, fuck, that's what a metal band should sound like. Regarding, you know, the early influences for me, uh, going back to when I, I didn't play guitar and started getting into metal, I had an opportunity to to bugger off on the road with, you know, one of New Zealand's most established bands in, in Chuggernaut, which were a fantastic bunch of guys and, and girls. Lindley was, was their drummer. Um, and of course, you know, being with, with those guys, I had that opportunity to go on the road um, and, and meet meet some fantastic um, musicians who, who had turned out to be, you know, the, the pinnacle of things in this country. Um, Nail, uh, an absolutely amazing guitar player who, who to this day probably puts on one of the best shows out of everyone I've seen in, in, in the industry. Um, Nail, so Nail was a big influence on me, so I thank them for that opportunity. Stu Munro, Nail, they're all fantastic guys and girls. And, and absolute pleasure to be with them and, and have that influence. But on that tour I also met Paul Martin, um, who everyone will know is the Axe Man from the Axe Attack, and his band World War IV, one of the best guitarists in this country, um, has done more for metal in this country than anyone. Um, he's plugged our, our stuff and, and played our album on his show a lot of times, so big ups to that. And, and, and you know, as far as the big three is concerned, they'd be in it. Uh, Nail, the Axe Man, and of course uh, Gary, Smith from Eight Foot Sativa, um, being one of the, the best guitarists in this country as well, and, and one of the biggest influences on, on what I've done. So, so thanks thanks to those three for what you've done over the years and, and the influences you've you've given me. And um, big cheers to fucking brutalities, man. Um, Chrissy and Dan, man, they they were um, yeah a big help to us making that gear for us, you know. Um, yeah, like people just seem to be so keen to to help us out in those days, man. Like once we started taking taking off and playing the Wiki P live for a few shows and that, man. Like everyone, just all the local uh, musicians and bands around New Zealand just seem to be just the friendliest bunch that you'd ever meet, you know. Uh, you look at them and think, you know, these guys are rough as like mongrel looking cunts. You probably don't want anything to do with them, but. I tell you, people in metal bands are, are the nicest people you'll meet. Tie happy, tie happy. Dead Elements, well, we were real excited as a band, firstly coming from the Wiki P and the Three Piece, uh, to getting Damo in the band and, and writing some music that was, you know, a step up in pace. I'd, I'd hope to think a step up in quality and a, an all round step up in heavy uh, from, from Wiki P to, to Dead Elements. So the boys. We were real excited about being given the, the opportunity with, with Josh. Just seemed always, uh, barely knew the guy, but was so keen to help out. Just out of his own free will, you know. Like, and he had all this recording gear and a bit of know-how to, to do recording and stuff. And he was fairly new to, um, you know, recording bands and stuff like that himself. So, um... Yeah, he, he had an empty house in Tai Happy where he farmed all this land, you know, around the um, around the house and that and um, so he just basically said, Yeah man, you guys, man, you guys need to come out, spend a weekend in Tai Happy and we'll record an album. The house. It was a uh, old old farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. With a uh, quite a scenic Gravel, gravel road, which was very fun to drive. It was, um, it was solid, nice house, warm, freaking log burner. The buzz, the buzz of us, just us five, yeah, six, six of us in that house. Myself, Damo, Jamie, Matt, uh, Josh, and uh, yourself, James. Um, I just remember rocking up to that house, there's this beautiful scenery and the house was in the middle of nowhere, literally like hills around you and just us in Thai Happy and um, all we had to do was spend the weekend making an album. Yeah, we had a, had a great time even, I mean we had, there was no cell phone reception, no TV or anything so we were basically away from the westernised world for a whole weekend and then come back into town. And that was when a big volcano erupted, so 
we were like, yeah, I mean, that was that was us because we were recording that album. It was so brutal. They just the world just didn't want to live anymore. No. And it pretty much involved um, Josh Williamson who sourced the place for us, um, taking us out there and setting up his own equipment, which he provided his time, venue, gear, all for free, just for the benefit of um, learning more about his own equipment, really, which was a fucking big, big favour from his behalf. And fucking big kudos to that man. So boys and girls who have uh, reached us here in this beautiful fucking town of the same in the town, Chai Happy, what's been going on? Man, you're gonna sleep till like half past four in the morning. I'm broken shot, man. Man's just decided to get into his drums finally. Probably nearly lunchtime. <laughs> We're gonna get 12 songs done. It's brutal. We've killed some possums. Um, this is probably about it. We went in there determined as that we were going to do a 12 song album and uh, I mean I think it got to the point of it was Saturday and it was about, I think there's a video of it somewhere but there, there was about like, it was like lunchtime on a Saturday and we'd only done like three songs of the drum tracks which was the first stage. And he's like, so what do you want to do, man? Yeah, we're going to call it. Yeah, should we just do like a couple more? And we're like, nah, we're doing 12. <laughs> Number four is no part. This is the fifth one. Yeah, this is the fifth one. So have a think about that. Like, this is the fifth one that you're up to, and it's half past one. I'm, I don't care. I'm not fucking tired or anything. I mean, yeah. but I'm just, just so you sort of. You know, to get through that much, um, I, I take my hat off to Matt because, you know, drum, being a drummer is obviously. What, what needs to be the, the tightest uh, part of, of the recording process and, and getting all that stuff done first. So I can't can't recall how many hours it took Matt, but I, I know he did have his work cut out for him and, and did bloody well. Your ass down on all fours and brave. Yeah, like boy, and donkey. That is for fucking <laughs> recording period, my friend. <laughs> and, and from there, the drum tracks were down in the first night. Uh, a lot of piss was drunk, which was probably a bit of a downfall. But you know, we 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 did perform best under a bit of liquor, I believe, in those days. Um, smoking up a storm as well. Probably not a good thing for Ryan, having to get into a vocal booth and scream his lungs out after smoking copious amounts of cigarettes, the, the good stuff, and cigars were going around at that time as well, so maybe it was conditioning, maybe it wasn't, but it all worked out for the best. Um, we got it all down.
supposed to get this bitch sedated. I'm so fucking sick of fucking bitch cremated. Oh, hell, I think I need glasses because I got my cock, I cock in the rash. It's like I said, I like I'm old. No Kathy Fiddler, the Mac Daddy Riddler. Oh, hell, I'm Bat Midler. You know I ain't faking because these words and the truth go together like cheese and bacon. Look what you got me making. I rip about big back and old bitches. They come to this and they give you the itches. Not the kind you pick up and take to the pictures. They give me a minute or two to recap old reviews and give me the twist to do's. I'll throw some silly poo. It comes as kind of cheese. You want somebody to say yes, please? You may think I'm insane or just play strange. I'm just sick of the range. Ain't nothing gonna change. So it's a statement with my head is a mention. Tune next to folks. This is Bubble Jesson. There's no one. 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 We fucking uh, sat around the table with the finished raw product, cigars and beers and joints and fucking went till the early hours of the morning again doing that. Uh, we decided to uh, get away and go for a bit of a ride and drive and walk over the farm just to um, just to escape it all and give our uh, eardrums a bit of a rest. It was all a bit much for a uh, for a 16 hour day on a Saturday. Tell us about Sleep with the Worms. It's about fucking stopping being a sad sack. Get the fuck back on your feet. Get out there and live your life, motherfucker, without being a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dan Martin ended up, uh, I, don't, I don't actually know if he volunteered or he was nominated, <laughs> but he did it. Uh, he mastered everything and, and it was just amazing. Like the, um, the intensity of the, of the tracks was, uh, really good. I mean like even though we, we recorded that stuff with no metronome so the drums were like all over the place. Um, everything was just all over the place uh, and he tidied it all up and made it sound fucking brutal. <laughs> Which is awesome. There was concerns I had said to Dan after we'd sent what we what we'd done until I had be through to Dan. I had explained to him, you know, this is this is what I like and Parkway Drive's been a big influence being tuned to drop B like us. The guitar tone was, was something I, I took a liking to and of course their, their music and seen them live and look up to them a lot, you know, their music has, has been a big influence. So I'd said then, I want my guitar tone to be, you know, similar to this and, and sent him some new Parkway stuff and he come back to me and said, you know, I, I can't, with what I've got, I can't, I can't do it. So, you know, it was a bit of a, a bit of a down buzz, you know, we thought, fuck all this hard work, you know, now what are we going to do? So I had to, you know, knuckle down borrowed some gear thanks to uh, Mikey and, and Matt at the rock shop for hooking me up with, with a decent valve amp to use and sat down for, God, oh, would have been a good 24 hours straight really in the in the dungeon at home and just re-recorded every single guitar track three three times over for Dan so he could have his pick of the bunch and then let him take care of the, the mastering of it from there, so just sent him clean tracks and he said these are awesome, which was a, a massive relief, you know, we thought fuck all that hard work and tired is going to nothing and you know the gear I had wasn't the best at the time, which is a reflection on, on what the finished product was, but that was, yeah, that was a bit of a scary moment, but it also gave me 
a lot of time to get things tight and, and perfect, which it, it ended up being pretty good. Um, it also gave Ryan an opportunity there to set up a, another microphone in, in another room, basically, and, and Ryan added in some some second vocals, which uh, have obviously been a, a big help in, in what, what the album ended up being, and I think it gave Dan a, a lot more to work with as far as range of vocals. Uh, Ryan, Ryan may have been getting a bit tired there towards the end, having to bust out so many tracks in a, in a short space of time, um, but having those backups that we we done in the dungeon there at the main was was really good to to give Dan that, that extra amount to work with. When we got that finished product back from Dan, I remember going around to Jamie's and he chucked it on, and uh, literally um, I was jumping. We I looked at Matt and we were both did the old <laughs> yeah 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 this is me jumping up and down like the excitement level. <laughs> And still feel, and even my dog's getting excited. Annie, get out of it! Yeah, there you go. You was little tiny money that was invested in the product. Yeah, that's possible. Big ups to to Josh for giving us that time, uh, giving us that setup, and, and giving us all that gear to get the album done. You know. At no cost was was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Dan Martin qualified and and what he just just done out of music school there, pretty much wanted to use us as a guinea pig. So you know we, we didn't have to shell out a great deal of money to Dan. So I'm always going to be grateful for that and and we'll go back to you Dan in, in future years over in, in the UK or wherever you may be. Um, and you know what you done for for us was fantastic in your first efforts at, at mastering a, a full length album. Uh, well Dead Elements once the album was recorded obviously we had to, to get it out there and you know I, I myself took took pride in, in organising as much as I could you know knowing that if I'm going to do it the, the job's going to get done. Um, so we put together a bunch of shows in, in the North Island too in Palmy, one, one all ages and, and one at the, the Royal R18. Uh, we, we got to Wellington, we got to New Plymouth of, of course there may have been another show or, or two in, in there somewhere, but then a, an opportunity presented itself to me, which I, I did drop us in there and, and said, you know, would you like to have us on board? Because the South Island was obviously a, a new dimension. We'd never ventured down there, and, and it turned out to be one of the, the greatest experiences of my life, uh, playing those three shows down there. Um, and, and hails to Sam Shepard for getting us on board for those those gigs um, and it, you know we, we knew it was going to be some hard work we had to save a bit of money and, and get, get some albums sold so props to everyone that, that bought an album and, and helped us get get down south because it, it did cost us you know well over a grand to, to go there um, with the ferry with the rental car um, with, with everything we needed to, to, to pay for on that, that weekend um, it, it did cost us a lot. Uh, the highlight of my musical career for sure like live performances wise just the buzz the, the 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 band morale getting over there you know on the ferry cracking the heineken at 10 in the morning when the bar opened i mean those little things are the things i remember you know on the way there just you know on that ferry leaving the north island going to the south island and Really having no idea what I, we what was we were going to do. What, what what was you know we had the gig set out, but what else do you do? You know, like fuck, where were we going to go? What was it going to be like? It was uncharted waters for me and, and probably for the whole band. Then we made our way to um, the the car rental place. We got our car. We were on our way off to Nelson. Um, and that was that was great. What up? You got a rap for Mike? Yeah, man, we got a rap for Mike. What's Mike's rap? Yo, motherfuckers, I had money now and spend. Cause I'm Mike from Life for Men. Yeah, I gotta pay him my motherfucking rent, but that shit don't matter cause I'm Mike from Life for Men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Live on the street yeah. with the cows. Yeah, straight out of Huntley now. Oh, oh, it's my habitat. Ow. Yeah, Mike from Life for Men. Pow. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first memory of the trip is um, sitting outside the bar that we were going to play in. And it was, um, it was, 
all of us but Jamie. Jamie was sitting inside on the pokies. We were sitting outside drinking piss, unbeknown to us that we were drinking all the band money. <laughs> and all our band money was going in the poker machine. But whether you put that in the documentary, it's up to you. <laughs> First time in the fat bar, it was loud. Wicked. Fucking everything come together nice. Hanging out with Snape was fucking cool. They're just a bunch of good dudes. Them, the band and the whole crew, everything was good. Then afterwards we went back to Madness's and we hit the hit the whiskey hard. <laughs> you busted out some pretty awesome whiskey. The best the best night we had was um, Nelson the first night. Our good mate Madness um, put up put beds up for us, mattresses, blankets, you know, had his house, man it was it was all good. Day two of the tour here. Coming through, catch the Mice boys after a mean show on Nelson with the Nate last night. Fuck as clearly as you can see. This currently driving through the Lewis Pass, centre of the South Island. Fucking beautiful drive this one. Nelson to Christchurch was a long day. Long drive. Hungry drive, hungover. And our, our good old good old mate James. Just a uh, little bit heavy on the old right foot, and uh, we ended up getting chased down by the police. <laughs> Alright, time for an update here. Somewhere in between Nelson and Christchurch, this man over here has some paperwork from the fucking police. Being the case of my driver for this weekend has taken a dramatic turn for the worst. King James has lost his license for 28 days. Doing 144 clicks. Very unfortunate situation. Not to blame him myself, but this is all in the fucking name of metal. Getting to Christchurch, getting lost. Christchurch. Seeing some of the devastation from the September earthquake was a fucking bit of a shock at times. Checking out the, uh, the venue that we were playing at and realising we're in the middle of nowhere. Uh, a bit different as well. Being told by the um, bar owners that we weren't allowed to drink. Devastation. Yeah. Fuck, how else do you get rid of a hangover? Yeah. <laughs> this sort of shows, the next two shows, the next two days after that Nelson gig, um, for me, sort of suffered a bit because I, I pretty much just fucked myself on the first day, partying too hard with Sinead after the show because man those guys can drink some piss I tell you that um, definitely had um, my work cut out keeping up with those fellas I cruised off into the um, toilet block you know for the last minute piss before I go and tune up and I found our vocalist Ryan vomiting his guts out and I thought fucking oh fuck <laughs> You are right, bro? <laughs> He's like, yeah, man, I was a Samira. I thought he'd lost his voice. <laughs> but um, to his credit, by the time I got back out, tuned up my bass, set up the amp, found my sound, and in that time, Ryan had come out and he put on a fucking bucket shot, considering he had no voice and no guts. <laughs> Just left it in a good gut and the fucking toilet. Poor bugger. <laughs> Seven day free off the Dunedin. Full challenge last night. 
Driver and co-driver today. <laughs> and you've had like a fucking mean roast on a Sunday night and it's about 7.30 and you hit the fucking toilet for a mean poo. And you fuck that first clock through a wide burst and it's just like, whoa, man, that was quite... Have you, have you ever got the mean shit and it's like halfway through and it's just turned massive and it's like... Yeah man, uh, it quite hurts, so you got to take it easy and fucking before you turn your ring piece inside out. <laughs> but fuck yeah, no, I love a good poo, eh? That is Palmerston. Oh fuck. At least we live in the better one. <laughs> Go on, wins, guys. These guys have got the shit pumps today. Eh? <laughs> it's like fucking stepping back into medieval times. Mm. Playing a gig at two in the afternoon, it's most unusual. But fucking good though, it was good. Nice little compact stage, pool table, toilet that looked like it was an outhouse fucking dugout, you know? It was, yeah, it was great. I felt the, the effects of the last fucking, the night before and, you know, the night before that and, man, I remember saying, I remember saying to uh, Matt Shepard, man, how do you do it, like, how do you do it every night like this, like, tour, you know, for weeks on end and just keep going and he said, well, you've either got it or you don't. And then, <laughs> sort of, I thought, oh, fuck, you know, didn't know how to take that really, is that a compliment or a fucking insult or should I better step up my game if I want to be as good as Matt from Sinead, I remember that's what I thought. Alright, let's break this shit down! for the locals I'm sure. Yeah. Pissing on cats. <laughs> yeah. And the stock cars. Stock cars in Dunedin was cool. and money and uh, Sam Shepard from Sinead went around um, went around this whole party with a hat asking for any sort of spare change money anything you know for for some more piss so anyone sober anyone was sober and there was no one fucking sober but I just, just decided to drive anyway uh, jumped in the rental me and Sam off the supermarket we managed to get 140 bucks from that party and I just remember walking around the supermarket with him. I was pushing the trolley and I was thinking, fuck, I'm cruising around the supermarket with Sam Shepard buying some pass. This is awesome. And uh, we get to the fucking counter and he's counting out all the fucking traps and shit that he had. And the woman's laughing at him with a trolley full of fucking piss. And uh, we ended up being short by um, a couple of bucks or something, I remember. And... Um, the good bitch at Countdown uh, let us off, and um, I think they had something to do with uh, how cool Sam Shepard was. <laughs> you know, he um, 
Yeah, man, he just hit the gift of the gab there and uh, managed to get some fucking piss. We didn't even have enough money. Berg party. And that party went on till the sun came up. <laughs> and then we took off to the airport and came home. That was fucking greatest time of my life. <laughs> Well, after the after the South Island tour, I had a bit of a rough patch in, in my life that needed to be fucking sorted out there and then. So it was it was at that time that we decided to have a little bit of a break away from from gigging for a few months um, and just just yeah, one to, to have a bit of a rest from from all the all the shows on the road. But you know, I, I put my hand up as the one that needed to help at that time to. Um, to sort my, my shit out pretty much, which I, I went away and did. Um, and, and then of course went, went back home to, to Gisborne and, and we sort of thought, you know, well me personally thought the, the cage can't really end on, on these sort of terms. So we jacked up a, a show in unfamiliar territory of Inglewood. The last show, when I heard those words, the last show, at first I was really happy because I thought it was over before then, you know, I thought we could probably never play again. Everyone was in a happy space. It was, um, we started to catch up again. It was our first show since the South Island. And now he's a proud shot. Yeah, and thanks to, uh, thanks to Jonathan Brooking for putting it all on. And our machine. Awesome. Yeah, Inglewood, that was uh, pretty crazy. Um, I mean, most people just drive past Inglewood like, what the hell is this? But uh, we actually stopped there and went into a, a pub and played a gig and it was actually, actually fucking neat. Like, there was a lot of people and it was just a really good buzz. Um, yeah, it, was, yeah, it was good uh, reuniting with the cage. So being sad it was the last show and excited at the same time uh, brought out a lot of fucking yeah, uh, some realism for me, some some feelings, eh? Like uh, I remember being on stage and just this just had a feeling come over me um, like I've never had before. Just standing on stage with um, Jamie and Matt and Damo and thinking this is the last time, you know, this is it. I think they thought we could play even ridiculously fast. Just to, to get it there and, and have, see those familiar new comic locals in, in Inglewood and, and just to, you know, what at that time was kind of announced as the, the last show that we will do. But the, the reception we, we got and, you know, the, the, the feelings that, that went through the boys after that show and, and during that show was, you know, it was real heart, heartwarming and, and the reception was, you know, Cage can't, can't end, you know, what, what, what on earth are you guys thinking, um, ending, ending the, the good thing you've got going there, so it was a wake-up call for us really and, and, you know, what people were saying to us after that show was just a, a slap in the face really, you know, what are you guys doing, you idiots, you can't, you can't end, end what, what all, all that hard work, you know, that, that's gone on over the last five or six years. Um, so you know, it was it was good to hear that from people, and I think for Matt and, and Ryan and Damo and myself, at hit home. You know, we we got to keep the the cage going. So you know, hence after that show, there's been a, a couple more shows, which you know I'd like to to think there'll be plenty more um, over the year. So to see an end like that, yeah, it was a bit of a downer. But since then, we've done another couple of shows, and I always like to think that. Uh, we're a whistle around, you know, we'll pop up every now and then for a show. Probably won't do that much practicing, but you know, most of the demos disgust. <laughs> yeah. If it was up to me, you know, we'd fucking we'd still be going strong, you know, week in, week out, but when you're not living in the same city and that it's a bit hard. Um Yeah, nah, no, I'd say it's not over. In, in my eyes, uh, my hope it's not over. I, I, I reckon that uh, we've got so much more to do. We stopped too early. Um, yeah. I think we should um, 
Yeah, I think we should probably reunite and just carry on. <laughs> yeah, it's still obviously um, still jamming of um, Rob Project Blood's expanded from the from the start, obviously, with the introduction of um, um, Jared from Slave Cadaver and Aether and Damned Age. He's um, jumped on board to be our, our live drummer and obviously um, cemented his spot in the band quite nicely with his skills. And um, Mikey from Nutella Monk, Wing Turkey, and uh, he's, he's jumped on board to be our synth player, synth and keyboards. So yeah, we've um, certainly expanded as far as uh, band members goes from the early days. Uh, the recording has obviously taken preference over playing live shows, considering we played 14 odd live shows in our first year of gigging. We uh, decided to start saying no to gig offers, um, purely just to get the recording finished, which is very close. So, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to getting that released, get a few shirts done. And um, yeah, certainly uh, no time to sleep anyway. No way sleep when you're dead. And yeah, now now playing uh, playing guitar, which is uh, this is what I do anyway. Um, and playing that, playing guitar in Gift of Ruin in, in another metal band, and that's um, it's getting there. You know, it's like a. It's like a baby horse, you know, you watch it sort of get up and stumble around like a, like a fucking moron for a bit, but it's getting there, it's going to gallop pretty soon, you know. Uh, yeah, we're actually playing a gig tonight, June Fest, Monganui. Yeah. It's going to be pretty cool. But yeah, like I said, I moved back home to Gisborne, and you know, it's another new thing going back home now, as like I mentioned earlier, being into my rap music back in the day and, and not being a metalhead, so now I'm Tides have turned and I'm, I've gone back home as, as a metalhead and sort of hunted around the scene to try and find people to jam with. Um, it's given the opportunity with the boys at Harbinger to have a jam and they're all great guys with, with great talents so that's been good for me but also working on another project with a young fella Dan Ashcroft that's opened my eyes up as far as writing music is concerned and I think it's brought back a lot of the old Cage influences um, with, with the riffs and there was a lot of stuff you know in my brain that, that never got used so being able to put that out there again and, and start writing music has, has been really good but I'm, I'm sure you know with, with the cage we might not write many more songs I hope we get the opportunity to, to write something else in, in the near future but you know all, all the boys will, will still be doing big things and, and I'm sure that you know there'll be big things to come out of it and, and the cage will always be looked at as, as the stepping stone to, to bigger things to come so yeah look out, <laughs> the cage will be back.